and O oh Reader, our tale of science fiction. Welcome back to Paper Cuts, everybody. I forgot to pour myself some water before we got started. Large, large brain. My brain is so big. You know, water. That thing that allows us to function as human beings. Yeah, I need that. Uh, you know, because I am definitely verifiably a human being, not at all some kind of knowledge downloading alien that lives on the on the fourth planet of the Beta Agni cluster. Uh uh, no, I'm not here to download all your fiction stories and steal all your science fiction technology. No, I'm a human person for sure. Just just a grade A human man. Uh-huh. Not an alien here to steal your technology and your knowledge. Nope. I need water just like the average person. Skates boards. <laughs> anyway. Immediately, immediately. Uh, the second we start the <laughs> we start things, I get distracted. Uh <laughs> We, uh, last we left off with Kebo, 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 uh, sorry, I almost said it wrong, uh, I think he left a continent full of talking lizard dinosaur things, and is now fleeing from, uh, mm, now fleeing from, like, essentially moth possessed people like the 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 moths are parasites and they're eating people's brain it's a whole thing anyway that's roughly where we were last week let's uh dive into chapter 23 luno and beyond with no weapons except a steel knife and a wooden rapier the unkempt and bearded Earthman set resolutely out along the twenty-stod road which led to Lake Luno. All the rest of the afternoon he tramped along, avoiding the towns and taking cover wherever a, whenever a Kurkul approached. Night fell, the velvet, fragrant, tropic-scented night of Poros, and yet he still kept on, for he knew the road. As he trudged along, he tried to picture to himself the state of affairs in Cupia. Back in Verkingi, when at last he had succeeded in getting the Princess Leela on the air, she had mentioned the whistling bees just before Prince Yuri had cut her off. These bees were called whistling because of the heterodyne sound with which they appeared to converse, but Miles had discovered, by means of the greater range and selectivity of his own artificial radio speech organs, that this whistle was due to the bees sending simultaneously on two interfering wavelengths for signal purposes. When simply talking, they used a wavelength beyond the range of Cupian speech. Cabo had been able to adjust his portable set to this wavelength and had talked with the bees. As a result of this conversation, an alliance had been formed between Cupia and the Hymernians, as the bee people called themselves, which had driven Yuri and his ants from the continent. Thereafter, the bees had lived at peace with the Cupians, a special ration of green cows being bred for their benefit. What wondered Cabot had the had at the return had the returned Yuri done to de, uh, try again? What wondered Cabot had the returned Yuri done to disturb this state of affairs? If Portheris, the king of the bees, still lived, Cabot could not imagine him siding with Yuri. But whatever had happened, it was clear that the bees were at the bottom of it. Time would tell very speedily. Travelling on foot at night on the planet on the planet Poros, rather, is necessarily slow and tedious, for the blackness of the Perovian night is dense beyond anything conceivable on Earth. On Earth, even the light of a few stars would enable a man to distinguish between a concrete road and the adjoining fields and woods and bushes, but on Poros no stars are visible. Accordingly, Miles had to feel his way with his feet and fell off the road many times before he reached his destination. Due to the mountainous character of the country, most of these falls were extremely painful, and some were positively dangerous. Yet on he kept, and before long the lights of Luno Village loomed ahead. Even here it would not do to reveal himself in his present state of appearance, so he skirted the town and made his way down the steep path which led to the shore of the lake. 
If his island dwelling had been disturbed, he half expected to find that his boats were gone from this landing place. But upon groping about in the dark, he came upon several of them, tied up just where they ought to be. This cheered him immensely. But when he stared across the island and saw no sign of any light there, his spirits fell again. It was not the custom at Luno Castle to go through the night totally on the loop. He would soon find out what the trouble was. So, stepping into the one of the boats, he cut it. So, stepping into one of the boats, he cast off and paddled vigorously toward the middle of the lake. Keeping his bearings was difficult in the jet black darkness, but he was guided somewhat by the faint illumination sent skyward by the little village. Finally, he bumped against the rocky and precipitous sides of the island. But misjudging his location, he had to paddle nearly clear around the island before he came to the landing beach. This gained, he pulled his crafts ashore and groped his way up the narrow path to the summit, which sloped gently down, or rather, narrow path to the summit, that's where I was, thence across the lawns, which sloped gently down toward the center of the island, where lay a little pond with Luno Castle standing beside it. Miles ran into sh several shrubs, got completely mixed up as to his directions, and finally fell into the pond. This gave him a new starting point from which to orient himself. Walking around its edge with one foot in the water, he would diverge outward from time to time, until at last his groping hand touched a wall of masonry. It was his castle. He was home. But what did that home hold? His heart beat tumultuously with anticipation. Feeling his way along the wall, he came to the steps, and crawled up them to the great arched doorway. The door was closed, but not locked. Miles flung it open softly, and then entered, closing it behind him. Then, closing his eyes, he turned an electric switch, and flooded the hall with the light of many vapor lamps. Gradually opening his eyelids, he glanced around him. Everywhere was the musty odor of unoccupancy. He had expected either his family or a sacked and ruined castle, but he'd found neither. It would not do for the surrounding populace to discover his return until he was ready, so he hastily found a flashlight and then switched off the vapor lamps again. Flashlight in hand, he made a tour of the castle. Everything was in perfect order. Leela was a good housekeeper and had evidently been given plenty of time by Yuri to prepare for her departure. This spoke volumes for her safety and that of the baby king. Miles even found his own rooms undisturbed. This surprised him greatly. He had not expected this much consideration from Yuri, but then he reflected that Yuri must have been pretty sure that he would not return from the Earth, and had wanted to do nothing to antagonize Leela any more than absolutely necessary. This time, Yuri had been playing the game of love and empire with a little more finesse than usual. Miles, in his own dressing room, switched on the light. This was safe, as its windows opened only onto the courtyard. Then he bathed, shaved, trimmed his hair, and donned a blue-bordered toga in place of his leather verking tunic. On his head he placed a radio headset of the sort which he had devised shortly after his first advent on Poros, to enable him to talk with the earless and voiceless Cupians and Formians. Artificial antennae projected from his forehead. His earphones and ears were concealed by locks of hair, his tiny microphone between his collarbones by a fold of his toga. Artificial wings strapped to his back protruded through slits in his garment. Around his waist, beneath his gown, was the belt which carried his batteries, tubes, and the sending and receiving apparatus itself. Thus equipped, he surveyed himself complacent in the glass. Barring the absence of a sixth finger on each hand and a sixth toe on each foot, he looked a Cupian of the Cupians. Then he proceeded to the radio room. The long-distance radio set was in perfect condition, but there was nothing on the air. One of the three-dialed Perovian clocks showed the time to be 10.25, that is, half an hour after midnight Earth time. There was nothing further he could do before morning, so he lay down for a few hours of much-needed rest. When he awoke, it was broad daylight, 3.10 o'clock. The, the pink flush of sunrise was just fading from the eastern sky. Less than three... Less than three parts, six hours of sleep. Then he realized that he must have slept the clock around and more. A day's, gro a day's growth of beard confirmed this. It was now the beginning of his third. Oh. It was now the beginning of his third day in Cupia. 
he had been dead to Poros for fifteen parts. So he shaved, bathed, and breakfasted on some dried twig knobs, which was all he could find in the house. The courtyard garden was full of weeds, the lawn which surrounded the castle and the pond were uncut. Everything bespoke an abandonment many sanks ago. Oh, excuse me. After a complete tour of the premises, Miles hastened to the radio room and, tuned, and tuned in the palace at Kiarna. Rather, Kuarna. The result was the voice of the usurper Yuri testily calling the ant station in New Formia far across the boiling seas. From time to time there would be silence, during which the prince was evidently waiting for a reply, but none came. Otto the Bold had done his work of destruction too well. Miles chuckled. Yuri's frantic voice coming in over the air was a radio program much to Gabo's liking. Even the best Earth station of Columbia, national or mutual, couldn't surpass it. The only thing you'd rather hear would be his own sweet Leela. His recollection of Otto the Bold led him to wonder how the battle for Verkingi had progressed. Ruiz and Verkings on one side against Ruiz and Ants on the other. It was a toss-up. It seemed like it was years since he'd left the land of the fur furry ones. Otto, Grod, Ot, Yud... Teof, Crota, Arkelu, they all resembled mere shadows of a dream. The only, real, the only real feature that stood out in his memory was the radio set which he had fabricated. The only real, real rich, <laughs> real fear. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I make myself laugh sometimes. <laughs> then his thoughts flew to Yoth city of the Humangs, with its strange assortment of creatures, including Bumayala, the winged dragon, Kikul Muki, the serpent, Kabo shed a tear for Doggo and little golden-furred Quiven, and then came down to the present with a jerk. He was back in Cupia, clean, clothed, shaved, equipped, fed, and rested. It was now up to him to rescue the Princess Leela from her traitor cousin. First, he must find firearms, but of these the castle had been looted, for not a trace of a rifle, an automatic, or even a single cartridge could be found, though he searched high and low. So, reluctantly, he strapped on merely his verking sword and knife and ran down the path to the beach. In the boat once more, he paddled rapidly toward the shore. At the landing place, sitting on one of the boats was a Cupian, but as this man seemed to be unarmed, Cabo approached him without fear. As he came within an antenna shot, the man sang out, Welcome back to Cupia, Miles Cabot, depend, defender of the faith. Miles shaded his eyes from the silver glare of the sky. Nan, nan, he exclaimed, for the Cupian before him was none other than the young cleric of the lost religion who had helped to rebuild his radio headset in the caves of Carr during the Second War of Liberation. As the boat grated on the beach, the Earthman leapt out, and the two friends were soon warmly padded each other's cheek. These greetings over, Cabo asked, What good fortune brings you here? He found it easily to slip back again into the language of this continent. The holy leader detailed two of us, Nan Nan replied, to watch Ludo Castle, for you know he must be kept informed of everything as he waits within his caves for the promised day. Night before last, my colleague saw lights for a night, so this morning I decided to reconnoiter. Is Ovwa still holy leader? Yes, the grand old man still lives. Builder be praised, but how are my family? Both well, though for the past six or nine days the princess has not been permitted to communicate with anyone. Uh, why? He innocently asked. I know not. I thought that the holy leader knew everything. Well, as it happens, I can tell you. It's because I communicated with her a few days ago and informed her that I was about to return. Has no news of this got out from the palace? There is. Many much love. Uh, no, Nanon replied. But it explains why Yuri has kept a large squadron of whistling bees patrolling the eastern coast all day long every day. How'd you get by them? I came over at night, but... What about the bees? I'll tell you. Shortly after you left on your own visit, 
rather shortly after you left on your visit to your own planet, Minos, Prince Yuri flew back alone from his exile with the Formians beyond the Boiling Seas. This was the first that we of Cupia had known that any of them survived. Yuri kept these returned for his secrets for some time, but got in touch with some old supporters of his. First, he contrived to cut off the allowance of onks, which are doled out to the bees for food. And then he stirred up trouble among the bees because of this. The bees imprisoned Portheris, their king, and, under promise of an increased allowance of food, seized the arsenal at Kuana, their air base at Wartusa, and Luno Castle. As you know, the air navy has been practically disbanded, for there was nothing for it to fight. The rifles of the marching clubs had fallen into disuse because many other newer games had superseded archery. Uh, most of the rifles were stored in various central places, which the bees succeeded in seizing, after all. Some of the hill towns still had arms, but they surrendered these under threat of Yuri to kill the Princess Lila and the Little King. All the arms are now stored in the arsenal at the capital, under guard of Yuri's most trusted henchmen. A new treaty was made with the bees, giving them an increase in food, but even so, they are restive and held in check merely by the fear of anti-aircraft guns at Kiwana. Kiwana, rather. The general belief of the populace is that you are dead. Yuri's ruling strictly and has dissolved the popular assembly. The Pinquis everywhere are his personal appointees. These facts and the burden of supplying onks to the Hypermians irk the people, but they are important. Can a math lab struggle in the jaws of a woofus? Leela he treated well. If he had not done so, the populace would be against him, bees or no bees. And he's promised that the and he's promised the succession to little Q if Leela will marry him, but your dot dash message many sunks ago stopped that, for it showed that you still lived and had returned to Poros, although not to this kind. That's all. Now tell me of your adventures. But before replying with this, complying with that request, the Earthman asked, "What's become of the loyal Prince Toron, my chief of staff, Hababa? Hababa." I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to laugh at that name before I continue the sentence. Hababa. <laughs> the chief of staff, Hababa. He blows great bubbles. <laughs> oh man, that name is not it, well. Anyway. <laughs> what has become of the loyal Prince Toron and my chief of staff, Hababa, and Poblat the philosopher, and all my other friends and supporters? Every one of them, as so far as I know, is safe. Most of them are still hiding in the hill towns. Yuri's not risked the wrath of the populace by hassling them, and in fact has given notice that is so that so long as they behave, they'll be let alone. And then Cabot related all that had occurred to him, from the time he transmitted himself earthward through Poros down to the present date. When he concluded, he remarked, That'll be an antennae full for the holy leader, but... Now to get to work. On whom can I best depend in this vicinity? On Ensul, the veterinary. He lives in the village now. Return to the island and I shall bring him to you. Miles did so, and in a short time, the three were in conference in the castle. It seemed to Miles that the first thing to do was to recover his airplane, rifle, and ammunition from the waters of the pit, but Ensul demurred, said he. Huge dark green water insects inhabit the pool. They are very like the red parasites which cling to the sides of onks, which we roast for food, but they are much larger, and the bite of their claws means death. The parasites to which the veterinary alluded had always tasted to Cabot exactly like earthborn lobsters. The description of these new beasts were further suggestive of lobsters. He asked Emsul for a more detailed description, and found that this tallied still further with the earthly prototype. This reminded Miles of an interesting experiment which he'd seen tried in the Harvard Zoological Laboratory and which he now hoped to put to practical use. Uh, have these creatures a gravitational sense organ? Yes, although it is unlike ours. We Cupians, and I suppose you Minorians, have inside the skull, on each side of the head, a group of three tubes like the spirit levels of a carpenter. The corresponding organ of the scissor-clawed beast is different, although serving the same end. 
on each side of the thorax of these creatures, there is a spherical cavity with a small opening to the outside. This opening is just large enough to admit a grain of sand at a time. The membrane which lines the cavity exudes a liquid cement which unites into a little ball the grains of sand which enter. The cavity is lined with nerve ends, and, as the ball always rolls to the bottom side of the cavity, the beast is able to tell which direction's up and which is down. Cabot clapped his hands in glee. This was exactly as in the case of earthborn lobsters. Is that actually how lobsters tell what direction they are? Like, tell what direction is down? That's kind of fascinating. Like, they have a little organ that's like, it forms a ball of sand that naturally falls to to the ground, basically downward. That's fascinating. Can someone fact check that for me? Because if that's real, that's super cool. Uh, they don't know what they won't know which is which is up and which is down when I get done with them," he exclaimed crypt cryptically. It was quickly arranged that Nan Nan should go at once to the village near the lobster pool and exchange a gang of Cupian and engage a gang of Cupian men to cut a swath through the thick woods which hem in the pool. When this was completed, he was to send a messenger to Luno Castle to summon Cabot, who meanwhile could be prepared and engaged in preparing certain mysterious electrical apparatus. For the present, the Earthman's return was a secret. His plan worked to perfection. Only one day was consumed in chopping the path through the woods, and on the second day after his meeting with Nan Nan and Emsul, Miles proceeded to the lobster pool by the Kirkul with his electrical equipment and several boats. I tried to get all the eons out before stream, and it didn't work. I got some of them, but not all of them. Alright, chapter 24, The Lobsteroid Circuit. Miles could not help comparing his present ease of passage down the swath cut by the Cupians with his difficult grab grubbing through the shrubs a few feet an hour, or even with forcing his way behind the wedged-faced insect. Upon his arrival at the brink of the abyss, his first act was to test the black sand with an electric coil. As he had expected, it was magnetite, the only iron ore which will respond to a magnet. It was the same ore as he had used in his crucibles while making his radio set in Verkingi. This preliminary disposed of, cables were quickly stretched back and forth across the pit, and from these cables, large electromagnets were hung close to the surface of the water. Wires were run from the lightning, from the lightning system of a nearby town rather lighting system. Wires were run from the lighting system of the nearby town to a master controller at the top of the cliff. When all was in readiness, the Earthman threw the current into all the circuits. The result was immediate. To the surface of the water there floated, bottom side up, a score or more of lobster-like creatures, each the size of a freight car. Poor beasts. The pellets of sand and cement in the cavities of their gravity sense organs were composed of magnetite, and this being attracted upwardly by the suspended electromagnets gave the poor creatures that up was down and down was up. Consequently, reversing their position and floating to the surface, they imagined, with what little imagination their primitive, primitive brains were capable of, they were resting peaceably on the bottom of the lake. Next to their returned on, in place of the suspended magnets, a number of magnets lying against the steep side of the pit near the surface of the water, and instantly all the lobsteroids rolled over with their bellies toward that side of the pit. The experiment was a complete success. Grappling hooks and blocks and tackles were then brought, and dragging was begun for the airplane, the ant rifle, and the bandolier of cartridges, which Miles had lost on, on the night of his landing at Cupia. The radio man himself, stationed as switchboard, manipulated the instruments. Presumably, all three of the sawed articles were near the bank where Cabot had landed, so fishing was begun at that point, while energized magnets, across the pond, 
drew the huge crustaceans away. Even so, several of them swam back and snapped at the grappling hooks. This gave Miles an opportunity to practice his controls. Whenever one of the monsters of the deep would approach any of the dredging apparatus, the radio man would close the switch, which controlled some nearby magnet, whereat the bewildered beast would be thrown completely off his balance and would require several paraparths before he could orient himself to the new lines of force. By the time that this had been accomplished, Cabot would have switched on some other magnet, thus again upsetting the beast's equilibrium. It was truly a weird and novel tune which this electrical genius of two worlds played upon his keyboard while huge green shapes moved at his command. Finally, Miles got so expert at this strange game that it became safe for his workmen to descend into the pit without fear of the de denizens of the deep. At last, the ropes were securely fastened to the ant plane, and it was drawn up the bank to safety. The firearm and ammunition followed shortly after. The forces of the true king, Baby Q, were now armed with one small airship, one rifle, and one bandolier of cartridges. You must attack at once, Anon asserted. The Earthman looked at the Cupian in surprise. Well, why? Because if you don't get some of this, if you don't get someone of this, because if you don't, someone of this village is going to get word to Prince Yuri of your return. Although no announcement has yet been made of your identity, this feat of yours is, of overcoming the Scissor Beast is as good as a verbal introduction. Runners will soon be notifying the ups usurper. Why runners? Why not radio? Mm, because I took the precaution to throw an adjusting tool into the local motor generator set early. Motor generator set this morning. One of the solenoids is hopelessly jammed, and it'll take several days and nights of steady work to restore it. Ugh, great are the ramifications of the lost religion. But the cleric, the cleric pouted in spite of his tone of approval. There were no ramifications to this accomplishment. I did it all myself. Uh, I have it your own way, but to get back to what we were discussing, how am I to attack the usurper with no troops and only one plane and only one rifle? But you must attack. As for the planes, every plane in the kingdom, save only yours, is under lock and key at Wartusa the old naval air base, which is now the headquarters of the Whistling Bees. Every firearm, save two, your rifle, and Prince Yuri's automatic, is under heavy guard of the Kuana arsenal. Only the pretender himself and the arsenal guards, who are trusted henchmen of his, are permitted to be armed. And I suppose you expect me, alone and single-handed, to seize the Kuana arsenal and distribute arms to my people. But not exactly. You see, at which point the conversation was interrupted by a body of troops, four abreast, which came marching toward them down the aisle which had been cut through the trees. Cabot stepped back, aghast, trapped. The soldiers swung along in the perfect cadence which he'd taught them by generations spent in the marching clubs, or hundreds of cupia. Sure, they were unarmed, but one could, what could one armed human do against such numbers? Cabo glanced down the path and saw hundred after hundred turn into it at the farther end. There was only one possibility of escape. His plane. But the plane was still dripping from its submergence in the pond. Would it, would its trophil engine start while wet? Had enough water leaked into the alcohol tanks to damage the fuel? Well, he had to see. Shouting to Nan Nan and Emsul to follow, he started toward his craft, but then the young cleric brought, blocked his way treachery. No, for the young priest cried out, We are not defender of the faith. These be friends. They are the armies which you are to lead against Yuri. They are marching clubs of the loyal hill towns, which have been called together here ostensibly for an athletic tournament. Kabo stopped his mad scramble of retreat and smiled. With such men he could reconquer Cupia. Yuri or no Yuri, bees or no bees. The foremost hundred debouched and formed in company front. Then from the ranks stepped Cupian, who snatched off his blonde wig, revealing ruddy locks beneath. Onto his own right chest he pinned a red circle, the insignia of Field Marshal. It was Hababa, chief of staff of the armies of Cupia, 
who had been Kebo's right hand, ma right hand man in the two wars of liberation. Facing the troops, he gave a crisp command. Ev up shot every left hand. Then wheeling about, he held his own hand aloft and shouted, Yahoo, Miles Kebo! We are ready to follow where you lead. Yahoo! The, tr the troops echoed in unison. Then, giving the men, giving his men the order at ease, Ha strode up to the Earthman. Warmly, the two friends patted each other on the cheek. It was many thanks since they'd seen each other, and much had happened in the meantime. A council of war was immediately held between Miles, Ha, Nan Nan, and Emsu at the plain. Won't this gathering come to the attention of Yuri? Uh, won't he at once suspect its cause? In view of its, you know, nearness to Luno Castle, and in view of my recent radio announcements from Verkingi? Mm, I doubt it. We've wrecked every radio set in the vicinity, said Baba. But this did not assure the Earthman as much as it might. It would seem to me that this very fact would print would put Prince Yuri on his guard. Hmm, possibly so, but it will take four days for investigators to cover the thousand stods from Kiwana to here by Kerkul, two days by B, Nan Nan ruefully admitted. And in the meantime, it'll take our plane two days to reach Kiwana and our Kerkul's four. Then, had we not march, had we better not march it openly and at pace? This suggestion was accepted, with a reservation, however, that the return of Cabo and the existence, or rather, the existence of their plane, were to be kept as secret as possible. Accordingly, the main body of the troops were put on the march toward Kuana, under M. Sewell, with instructions to requisition every available, available Kirkwall, wreck every radio set, and place every settlement under martial law. The Kirkwalls, as far as seized, were to be manned by the best sharpshooters and sent ahead. The local village and the lobster pond were placed under heavy guard, and the earth man with his plane and rifle remained under cover. That night, just at sunset, he started forth. The airship had been stripped to its lightest, and in it were crowded Miles Cabot, Hababa, Nan Nan, and half a dozen sharpshooters. Long before morning they came up with the lights of the foremost Kirkuls, and were so forced to cease their advance, whereupon they landed, and encamped for the rest of the night, and the following day. All day long, Kirkuls passed them on the road, stopping to report as they passed. Apparently, a surprising number of these swift, two-wheeled Peruvian autos had been captured. The following night, the plane once again took wing, and continued till it caught up once more with the advance guard, of the taxicab army. These men reported that at the last radio station seized, they'd learned that Prince Yuri had put censorship on the air, thus showing conclusively that he, that the usurper, usurper rather, had learned something of what was going on. Then the Kirkul swept ahead, and Cabot encamped as before. He was now halfway to Kuwana, his loved ones, and Prince Yuri. Toward the end of the day, which followed, the advancing Kirkuls met a bombing squadron of whistling bees and were forced to halt and take cover as best they could. Most of the men escaped, but many of the machines had to be left on the road where they were demolished by the bombs of the enemy. Despite, during all this confusion, a Kirkul from the capital, bearing cross sticks as a flag of truce, drew up at the vanguard with the following message. King Yuri cannot regard the steady procession of Kirkuls toward Kuana as a menace, menace directed against him. If it is not so intended, then let a delegation in one Kirkul proceed under cross sticks to convince him of your sincerity. From now on, if more than one Kirkul advances, it will be taken as a hostile act, and Prince Q, the heir to the throne, will be sacrificed as a hostage. Upon receiving this message, M. Sewell immediately directed his followers to say where they were until Miles Cabot should catch up with them. Then, with a picked body of men, in one Kirkul, under cross sticks, he took up the, he took up the road toward Kuwana, 
preceded by the delegation which had brought the message from Yurik. Not a word would he give them as to the purpose of his advance. Your message was from Prince Yuri, he said, and therefore to Prince Yuri shall be the reply. But it does seem a bit thoughtless of the Hemenians to drop bombs on our men even before attempting to ascertain whether or not our advance was intended to be peaceful. To this they in turn made no answer. About midnight, Miles Cabot and his airplane reached the point where the Kirkhuls had halted. He found the Cupians confused and more or less leaderless. He, as he, as they, was horrified at the threat which the usurper Yuri held over the held over the head of the little king. But while he and Nanan -Nan and Hababa were conferring on the situation, word was brought in by a party who had just demolished a nearby radio set that they'd picked up the following unaddressed and unimagined group on the on the air. Fear not, baby Q has been kidnapped from the palace and a gift. Oh, I set down my, I set down my water for five seconds and I completely lose track of everything, don't I, Magnus? Oh. Where was I? I lost track of my spot. Uh, had picked the following unaddressed and unaligned message out of the air. Fear not, for Baby Q has been kidnapped from the palace and is safe. Somehow, this news carried conviction. The longer they considered it, the more authentic it appeared. Certainly, it couldn't have been emanated from Yuri, for he would have no possible object about deceiving them into thinking the little king was safe and that thus encouraging them to proceed with whatever they might have afoot. But they couldn't imagine who was their informant. It might be any number of leaders in Cabot's two wars of liberation. Poblath the philosopher, Mango of the Kuwana Jail, Jababa, Oyabu, and Boteddin. Boteddin? I'm sorry. That, um... No, I don't need to laugh at these names, though. No. I was talking about. <laughs> Poor <Tenen. laughs> Professors at the Royal University. Count Kamel of Khtu, the ex-radical, or even the loyal Prince Toran, Yuri's younger brother, whom Cabot had left in charge as regent upon embarking on his ill-fated visit to the Earth. All these loyal Cupians had been driven into bidding, or rather, all these loyal Cupians had been driven into hiding, and the renegade Yuri had returned across the boiling seas and usurped the throne with the aid of the Hymenians. Where they were now, no one knew. The message might be from any one of them, or it might not. Anyway, it seemed to hearten Cabot and his two companions, said Miles. Undoubtedly, there were some of Yuri, Yuri's Cupian henchmen on the backs of the bees which bombed her Kerbuls, but these have probably been supported by reported by wireless that our advance have stopped. I don't believe that Yuri yet knows that we have a plane. Accordingly, he will not expect immediate trouble, for as long as our vanguard remains here, for as long as our vanguard. Vanguard remains here 400 stods from Kuwana. You, Hababa, remain here in charge of our troops. I seriously doubt if the usurper will attack you, for he does not care. He does not dare trust enough Cupians with rifles for that purpose. Nan Nan and I and our shooters, our sharpshooters, will proceed as rapidly as possible in the plane. Until daybreak, when we will encamp as usual. Tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, and scouts ahead, or rather, tomorrow afternoon, send scouts ahead 
to destroy the wireless and start. Start what? If the page return. And start your whole whole Kirkwall army on the move at sunset. Bend every effort to join me as soon as possible in the capital. Where is it where I expect to arrive someday? No definite plan. May the great pillar speed our cause. Then he said good night and broke it off once more in his room. As he soared aloft with his noisy trophy motor, Earthmen could hear the captain's Earthmen would have heard it for stads in any direction. But these Cubians were earless and hence possessed no sense of hearing. Sorry, no sense of hearing as we know it. The noisy plane could make no impression under the antenna sense, or its engines being of the trophal variety, or diesel as we call a somewhat similar device on Earth, had no electrical in ignition. Throughout the remainder of the night, the plane sped southward, deviating from its course only when whistling sounds warned them of the presence of bees. With the first faint tinge of pink in the sky, they landed and saw and hid their airship in the hit in the edge of wood. Uh. Airship at the edge of the wood, 260 studs from Kuwana. Okay, clearly I need to stand because I am repeatedly losing my place. So I need a little blood flow. Ugh. Sorry, I slept incredibly poorly yesterday. So, you'll have to excuse if I'm a little sleepy. A small town lay nearby. To it went several of the crew in search of food and information, while the rest took turns, gu turns guarding the plane and sleeping. During Cabot's turn at watch, he noted a figure slinking across a neighboring field. There was something strangely familiar about this figure, so Miles hid himself in a tartan bush and awaited its approach. It walked with a peculiar limp, much like that which had characterized Bateden, ever since he'd recovered from the shell from the shell wound which he'd received in the Second War of Liberation. But the face and hair of the approaching Cupian bore no ex no resemblance to that of Professor Tedden. Nevertheless, Cabot took a chance. Stepping suddenly from his place of concealment, he shouted, Bo Tedden! Thereat, thereat, the Cupian emitted a shriek of terror from his antennae and started running away across the fields. Stop! I'm Miles Cabot! The fleeing man halted abruptly and peered at Miles inquisitively, and he smiled and snatched off his wig and straightened out his expression. It was none other than Bartet. Mm, so, you're the cause of all the rumpus. He returned, patting his friend warmly on the cheek. Uh, what rumpus? Wireless won't work, and no messages on the air anyhow. Nothing but beads. The air is full of them anyhow. Uh, also full of vague rumors of all sorts. As Poblath would say, where there's wind, there's a storm. Uh, speaking of Poblath, where is the philosopher? Kuana, I last heard. Jababa and Oyaba are somewhere in the west. Prince Toron has disappeared completely. Hababa and Emsul are supposed to be in the northern part of the Okarza Mountains. Kamel Bar Sakar has gone over to Yuri. I'm here. That about completes the list of formal leaders. Uh, Hababa is in charge of my unarmed forces. 160 studs. Uh, 160 studs north of here. Emsul is on his way to Yuri under cross sticks. I'm here in a plane with a rifle, non-non the cleric, and six unarmed sharpshooters. 
uh, what's the idea? The idea is to fly to Kiwana tonight and raise as much rough house as possible for Prince Yuri. Would you come with us? There's one vacant place in the plane. The Cupian looked at him admiringly and said, You're still the same old Miles Cabot. You proposed to capture Kuana practically without arms and single-handed, and the joke is that you'll probably succeed. How do you do it? <laughs> well, it's a gift, but trees have antennae, as Poblat would say. Let us proceed to the plane and wait for evening. At the plane, Cabot awakened one of the Cupians to take his place on guard. Then, in low tones, he and Botetan each related to the other all that had occurred since the matter-transmitting apparatus had shot the radio man earthward. Along toward night, the absentees returned from the village, bringing provision, but scarcely any news, except that the place was seething with suppressed excitement, and that they had succeeded in getting into the radio station and pieing the apparatus. And then let us start at once. Now, no one can now get word to Yuri, and perhaps they'll mistake us for Hammernian anyhow. But, as impatient as he was, Miles would hear none of that. They could easily dispatch a runner to some nearby town to send the message from there. Furthermore, a plane looks very little like a whistling bee. So the group feasted, and waited until the last streaks of red had died in the west before they shot into the air and south. The plane was driven to its utmost, but it was later than one o'clock before the lights of Kuwana loomed ahead. Turning to the right, Cabot skirted the city and landed near the arsenal, where Nan-Nan promptly left them. I have some church affairs to attend to. Oh, great are the ramifications of that lost religion, and I hope you pick up some useful information. After the young cleric had gone, Bateddon asked, Surely you don't plan for us to attack the arsenal. It's heavily guarded by the only man whom Yuri permits to carry firearms in the entire kingdom. Just to check. Yeah, we've got three more chapters. Okay. Mm. Chapter 25. All Kinds of Trouble We must reconnoiter first, for as yet I have no definite plans. And accordingly, they made their way to a grove of trees near the arsenal. Where they stood, they were completely enveloped by foliage and tropical darkness, but the arsenal was in a flood of light, which emanated from large floodlights on poles a short distance outside the surrounding wall. Along the top of the high wall walked sentinels, armed with rifles. Cabot quickly formed his plans. Turning his rifle and bandolier over to the best shot in the party, he instructed the sharpshooter as follows. When I raise my hand, like so, then shoot the sentinel to whom I'm talking. Follow that by a shot at the nearest light. Then, under cover of the darkness, sling across the plain and join me at the wall. Without any further explanation, he walked boldly out into the light. As he approached the arsenal, there rang out the cry of, HALT! And he halted. Who's there? Not so loud. You see I'm not armed. Let me approach near the wall so I can explain my mission, which is for your antennae alone. The sentinel signified his assent, and Cabot drew near. HALT! The cupian on the wall repeated, but this time in a low tone. Cabot halted again, this time almost directly under the light. Stand where you are, while I let down a ladder. Make any attempt to flee, and I'll fire. Miles remained where he was, with every indication of extreme terror, as the Cupian let down a rope ladder from the top of the wall and descended. Hold up your hands. Up shot Cabot's right hand. It was the signal agreed upon with the concealed sharpshooter. <coughs> The sentinel dropped to the ground without a sound. Bing! The light went out. Hastily, the Earthman exchanged his white toga for the black toga of his fallen enemy, and picked up the latter's rifle and cartridge belt. It felt good to have a real rifle-shaped rifle in his hands, once more in place of that buttless firearm of the ants. Just then a voice hailed him from the top of the wall. What's the trouble? Out of the dim twilight below, Miles called back. 
I shot a sutler. Just as I was about to search his body, the light went out. You got your flashlight with you? Yes. Then come on down and help me search. The second sentinel, eager for a taste of sutler's food after weeks of garrison rations, started to scramble down the rope ladder, but as he neared the ground, Cabot stopped to his, stepped to his side and put a single bullet through his brain. Out of the semi-darkness, around him, there arose seven forms. They were Bautedin and the six Cupian marksmen from the hills. Bautedin started to change clothes with the fallen guard, but Cabot stopped him, saying, N No, your lip would give you away. Let one of the others assume the personality of this sentry. One of the others accordingly made the, made the exchange. Then said their leader, two of, the co two of the posts of the guard are now cleared. Do you, marksmen, ascend, ascend the ladder and walk this beat, impersonating Yuri's guardsmen? The man did so, while those below cowered close to the wall. Soon Cabot heard a shot to the extreme right of the beat. Then a voice from above called softly, One less guard, Cabot. Three sections of the wall are now cleared. I have the body up here. Miles and one more sharpshooter mounted the parapet. Soon all three were walking post with the precision of old wartime practice, while the other five members of the party clung to the rope ladder under the shadow of the wall. Cabot himself walked to the leftermost post, and took pains never to meet the adjoining sentry. Thus nearly half a parth of time passed. Finally, an officer of the squad approached along the top of the wall to the left. Cabot promptly crowded to the extreme right-hand end of his beat, and cautioned his own adjoining sentinel to remain close at hand. As the squad drew near, he sang out, HALT! And the squad halted. Who's there? R relief Advance one and be recognized. The officer stepped forward. Advance relief. The officer brought the relief forward, halted it again, and called out, Number four. Thereat, one of the squad stepped from the ranks of port arms. Cabot himself came to port in unison. At this point, the routine ended. Tilting his gun slightly from its position, Miles suddenly fired two shots, and the officer and the new number four sank down upon the parapet. Instantly, the whole squad was in confusion, but before they could raise their rifles to reply, Miles and his companions riddled them with bullets. One of them, more quick-thinking than the rest, dropped prone without being hit, and cautiously drew a bead on Miles Cabot, who, seeing his enemies all down, had just paused to breathe. Neither he nor his companion saw his hostile move, and so Miles' other man was walking his post, far to the right in a military manner so as to attract no attention from the guardsmen further on. Everything was all set for a tragedy which would forever put to the end a hope of redemption of Cupia from the renegade Yuri and his B.E. allies. But just as the soldier was about to pull the trigger, a brawny arm slipped across his throat and yanked him backwards so that his gun went off in the air. It was Bartedon, who had crawled to the top of the wall in the rear of the squad. A shot from Cabot's companion promptly put an end to this last enemy. Then the seven conspirators searched the bodies and equipped themselves, Cabot pinning on the insignia of the officer. There were eight bodies, but some had undoubtedly fallen from the wall in the struggle. No, no time could be spared to hunt for these, and eight was more than enough for the present purposes. Miles formed his men in two ranks, counted them off, faced them to the right, and proceeded along the parapet, picking up his one already posted man as he went. Number six was relieved in true military form. He was too glad of getting off duty to notice the unfamiliarity of the officer who had relieved him. Similarity, similarly, was numbers seven, eight, nine, and so on. As he came to number eleven, Cabot began to worry that his, for fear that his supply of new sentinels might run out. Why hadn't he made some arrangement to have his own men rejoin him after being posted? But then he reflected that that would never do, for it certainly would have been noticed by the others. He was in a fix. Number twelve was relieved. All seven of his own men were gone, and Miles Cabot found himself the head of a squad composed entirely of the enemy. What would he do at number thirteen? But just as he was frantically turning this question over in his mind, he came to a long ramp leading inward from the wall, down to a small building between the wall and the main arsenal. He stepped back as though to inspect the squad, and they, without command, marched past him, 
turned and proceeded past number one down the ramp. This was the guard quarters. There were no more sentinels to relieve. Inside the buildings, he gave the commands. Relief! Halt! Left face! Port arms! Open chambers! Closed chambers! Dismissed! Hands up! This last one was not in the manual. The tired men on their way to the gun rack stopped in surprise. Up shot their hands, some first dropping their rifles, but some retaining them. It's Cabo, the Minorian, one of them shouted. The situation was ticklish in the extreme. The Cupians were scattered throughout the room so that it was impossible for Miles to cover them all simultaneously with his rifle. They were desperate characters, things of the worst type, typical henchmen of the Prince Yuri. If they started any trouble, Miles could expect to get one, or maybe two, of the seven before the rest would get him. And furthermore, they knew this. Back up, all of you, into that corner, quickly. But they didn't budge. Gradually, smiles began to break over their ugly visages. They realized that they had him at bay rather than he them. And what a prize he would be for presentation to King Yuri. Why, the king might even blow them to a beefsteak pot. The Earthman confronted them, unafraid. He still had the drop on them, and he intended to press, it, press his advantage to the limit. You, fat one, over by the rack, back into the corner, or I'll shoot you first. The Cupian addressed, a blade obeyed with alacrity. You, the scar, lay down your gun. Now you, back into the corner. The second soldier did so. Things were progressing nicely. One by one, he could subdue the Cupians confronting him. But just as he was exulting in his triumph, his gun was seized from behind. Turning, he saw number one leering at him. One blow from his fist in that leering face of the newcomer crashed to the floor, but before Miles could wheel to confront those in the guard room, they had rushed him and borne him to the ground. Catch him alive! One shouted, and that was the last that he heard, for something snapped in his portable radio set, and from then on he was deaf to antenna emanations. All he could then hear was an occasional rifle shot. In spite of overwhelming numbers upon him, he fought with feet and fists until at last the weight seemed to lessen. Finally, he struggled to his feet and confronted his tormentors. Could it be that single-handed he'd vanquished eight brawny Cupians? But no, for the figures he confronted were Bud Tedden and his own men. The eight enemies lay dead on the floor. The mutual congratulations were silently given. A quick inspection showed that the headset and the apparatus belt were hopelessly damaged, so that the radio man found a stylus and paper and wrote, My artificial antennae and the accompanying apparatus were ruined during the fight. Luckily, there is another set in the airplane. One of you go quickly and fetch it. One of the party accordingly withdrew. The others, rifle in hand, proceeded to search the building, but not a soul did they find. Although the couch had evident although the couches had evidently been recently occupied. It seemed likely that during the struggle in the guard room, the rest of the guard, being unable to reach the arms racks, had stealthily left the building. So, Miles and his party hurried on to the door, which led from the building into the arsenal yard. As they emerged, they were met with a volley from the arsenal, and three of their number went down. The rest beat a hasty retreat and barred the door. Then they made their way to the windows, which faced the main arsenal, but two more of them were picked off before they realized how perfectly they were silhouetted by the lighted rooms within. One of these two was Bud Tedden. Miles Cabot and one Cupid sharpshooter were all that were left of the party. As rapidly as possible, the two survivors extinguished all the lights in the guardhouse, then mounted to the roof, which was flat and surrounded by a low parapet, which protected them from showing themselves against the illumination of the surrounding vapor lamps. Crawling along the roof to the edge nearest the arsenal, they peered, ca they peered cautiously over. The whistle of a bullet caused Miles to duck his head, and he pulled his companion to cover as well. With his artificial antennae gone, he couldn't explain orally, and it was too dark to write. But the other followed him to the opposite edge, where they succeeded in potting the sentinels at posts two and three, which were the only occupied posts within sight. There appearing to be nothing further to be accomplished up here, they crawled down into the building once more, 
and took up their station at the windows of the upper story, from which they fired at every sign of movement in the direction of the arsenal, taking care to drop to the floor and change windows after each shot. Finally, their ammunition gave out, and Cabot went down to the guard room for more, but a long and careful search only revealed a few rounds. Miles returned to the upper story and groped through the rooms to find his friend. But it was his foot, rather than his outstretched hand, which finally found him. The Cupian sharpshooter lay dead. Miles Cabot alone, with only about a dozen cartridges, was the sole remaining defense of the captured building. No life seemed to be stirring on the arsenal side, so he crossed the building and looked out at the wall. Dark figures were stealthily creeping along where post number 12 should have been. The Earthman let them have it with rapid fire quickly disappeared. He now heard fighting in that direction, and the wall no longer showed against the sky. From time to time he fired where he judged the wall was so as to keep back the invaders, and thus entirely exhausted his ammunition quickly. Thank heaven, he said to himself, the downstairs door is barred. But as, it, but as he said to this, he realized that he had omitted to bar the door which opened toward the wall. And even as he realized this, there came a rush of many feet down the ramp, which led from the wall to this door. 26. The Debacle Miles drew his knife, crouched in a corner of the dark room, and prepared to sell his life dearly. He was ready for searchers who might come groping through the room, but he was wholly unprepared for the sudden switching on of the electric lights. As he sprang to his feet and rubbed his eyes, he saw before him Nan Nan and the sharpshooter whom he'd sent back to the plane to get a second radio set. Behind them in the doorway were a score or more of Cupians. Snatching the new set, he fastened it in place while the others waited. Then, articulate once more, You've come in the nick of time. How'd it happen? The young priest replied, Through the spies of our religion, I located Oyaba. He rounded up a number of his followers, and we hastened hither. The wall we found unguarded, with a rope ladder hanging down, and its foot six dead soldiers in black togas. We took their arms and mounted the wall, only they had been driven back by shots. Uh, my shots? Not at all. Some came from the arsenal. We could tell by the flashes. Uh, several of our party were hit, although not by you, so your conscience can feel clear, before we put a stop to this by shooting out all the outside lights. Then we rushed the guardhouse, and here we are. But where are your men? Dead. All dead. Even but Eden. Oyuba then stepped forward and greeted his former chief. Yahoo, Kabo! May the dead rest beyond the waves. We the living have work to do. Look, the sky turns pink and silver in the east. Morning has come. What do you propose? Morning means that the whistling bees will be upon us. We must capture the arsenal before they arrive. Hang on. Magnus? Magnus? Hey, buddy. Maybe leave the chair alone. Thank you. That sound good? You want to come sit up here? No, I want to sit in the chair. You are allowed to sit in the chair. Go for it. But you need to decide where you're going to sit so I'm not hassling you. There we go. Sit in the chair. Uh, where are we? The party then took inventory of their supplies. There were 48 ri 38 rifles, 40 cupians, and miles Cabot. One man was promptly sent to the roof with cross sticks. When these were recognized, 38 men under arms were marched up into the roof at well. It was considered advisable for Cabot himself to keep under cover. Then Oyaba unbarred the door and stepped out. An officer from the arsenal advanced to meet him, and the two gravely patted each other's cheek. The officer, whose rank was that of Puta, required, inquired, rather, What's the idea of defying your king, Professor? The idea is that we have come to restore Q the Thirteenth to the throne, and the Cupian to their prob proper dominion over the bees. The guardhouse, as you see, is manned by sharpshooters, fully armed. 
A vast force, unarmed but determined, awaits outside the walls. If you surrender, we shall spare your lives. If not, we shall rush the gates while our sharpshooters pick off anyone who opposes and kill all whom we find within. What say you? The Putar shrugged his shoulders. What is there to say? We surrender, provided we're given safe conduct. Safe conduct without arms? Agreed. So the guard, about a hundred in number, in their black togas, filed out of the arsenal, through the guardhouse, onto the wall, along it, and down the rope ladder. The ladder was then hauled up again, and the Putah looked around him. Where is your vast army? On the other side of the wall, Uyabo replied with a smile. Now run along away from here like a good little boy. But the officer and his followers started circling the wall to investigate. Before he gained the main gate, however, it had been opened, and for all he could tell, the vast army had passed inside. A guard stationed there advised them to get out of rifle range as speedily as possible, and twelve sentinels, who by now had manned the wall, bore out this menace. So, grumbling somewhat, the Putah led his men off toward the city. Thus did Miles Cabot and forty-seven practically unarmed followers capture the Kuana arsenal from its hundred defenders. Straggling Cupians now began to drift in from the city. These were put to work, carting arms and ammunition out of the arsenal, and stacking it up in widely separated piles wherever cover could be found. Every Cupian who reported was issued a rifle and a full bandolier of cartridges. Uh, we may perhaps thus arm some enemies, Miles admitted, but we must take the risk. A majority will be friends. It was well that they removed all the ammunition which they could. It would have been better if they could have removed more, despite working feverishly for half the morning, even taking guards off the wall for this purpose. But they'd scarcely made a dent in the supplies stored in the arsenal when a fleet of bees appeared on the southern horizon. In spite of the approaching menace, Miles and his men continued to work. The Hermernians flew low, straight at the arsenal, until a volley from Gabo's men brought down two of them and caused the rest to soar into the sky. Whereupon they started dropping bombs on the arsenal and on the men carting materials therefrom. Naturally, this put an abrupt end to Cabot's operations. His men scattered as rapidly as possible, and individually made for the city with small quantities of arms, keeping to cover as well as they could. Cupians from Kuwana helped themselves to the rest, and by nightfall the captured supplies were pretty well distributed. The arsenal, however, was a smoking ruin. All through the afternoon the bees, flying low, harassed whoever they saw moving on the streets, especially such as were carrying rifles, but these were retaliated by firing at all bees that came within range, in spite of what very few bees were killed. Night brought a cessation of this sort of warfare. Msul arrived, and of course at once gave up the idea of his projected peace mission to Yuri. He and Kabo and Nanan and Oyubu spent the night under heavy guard at separated points throughout the city, securing much needed sleep. Under cover of the darkness, Many of their followers foraged in the ruins of the arsenal and secured a surprising quantity of undamaged material, being joined in the morning by the army in Kirkpools from the north. Before daybreak, a resolute band of several thousand loyal Cupians had gathered in the streets and houses surrounding the palace, and promptly, at sunrise, they launched an attack. They had expected to find the palace guard unarmed, but... Evidently, a large quantity of the rifles and ammunition, which had been distributed throughout the city, had found their way to the palace, for the assault was at once repulsed by heavy fire from the palace guards. As Cabot's forces reformed for a second attack, they were deluged with explosives from above. The bee people had evidently not returned to their base at Watusa, but had spent the night nearby so as to be on hand to protect the palace. Whenever they sighted even a small group of Cupians, or wherever they had reason to suspect that some building was hostily occupied, there they would drop one of their devastating bombs. Cabot's forces were completely at the mercy of the Hymernians. There was but one thing to do. Flee. In vain, the Earthman and his able lieutenants tried to rally their troops. What was the use in assembling when assembly was the signal for a bomb from above? 
What was the use of attacking the invincible bees? Miles Cabot stood irresolute in one of the public squares. He was as near to despairing as he had ever been in his many vicissitudes on the planet Poros, since his first arrival there five Earth years ago. Oh, if only he had airplanes with which to subdue the Hymernians as in the days of old. Almost was he tempted to return to the vicinity of the arsenal, ascertain whether his one plane was intact, and if so, fly alone in a last desperate attempt to give battle to his winged enemies. The more he thought of the plan, the more it appealed to him. There seemed to be no other way out. His bravely engineered revolution had crumbled. If he stayed where he was, he would undoubtedly be tracked down and put to some ignominious end by the usurper. How much better, then, to die bravely fighting for Leela and his adopted country? And his baby? He wondered where the little darling had disappeared to. At least the infant king was out of Yuri's clutches. And so, his mind made up, Miles set out on a run for the wood overlooking the arsenal. After a few parapaths, he reached it, and there stood his plane. Rapidly, he went all over all the struts and stays and engine parts. Everything appeared to be in first-class order. The fuel tanks contained plenty of alcohol. How this machine had escaped capture or destruction was a marvel, but probably the bees had been too busy bombing groups of cupians to take the time to explore the apparently deserted grove. Miles sprang aboard and was about to start the trophil engine when a familiar sound smiting upon his earthborn ears caused him to delay for a moment. From the southward came the purr of many motors. Was the wish the father to the thought? His longing for an air fleet with which would vanquish, vanquish the bees had been so intense that it affected his mind and caused him to hear which things didn't exist. Impossible! The purr of the motors was unmistakable. He strained his eyes toward the southern horizon so they might see what his ears heard, but there was nothing there. The radiant silver sky was untouched save by an occasional small cloud. The bees still kept up their bombing of the city. He could see them flying low over the housetops and up and down the principal thoroughfares, ferreting out any groups of Cupians who dared to gather in Cabot's cause, dropping bombs on any houses which presumed to fly the blue pennant of the Q dynasty in place of the yellow of Yuri. The bees didn't heed the approaching planes from the south. Of course not. The whistling bees of Poros had no ears. They heard with their antennae, and heard only radio waves of that. In fact, only short-length radio waves. The noise of a large fleet of airships swept out on the south. Nearer and nearer it came until it was right over the city, and still not a single plane appeared in sight. Meanwhile, the bees continued their depredations, and the Earthman sat in his own plane, and watched and waited. As he watched, he saw one of the bees, who happened to be flyer, flying higher than the rest, suddenly vanish in a puff of smoke. Then another, another. The Hymerdians, too, saw this and rose to investigate, whereat there came the shut-off whir of descending planes. Fascinated, Miles stared into the sky, where whence came these sounds and occasionally, against gathering clouds, saw a glint of silver light. Several more of the ascending bees exploded, and now Miles was able to see from time to time, silhouetted on a background of cloud, the ghostly form of an airship. The bees saw, too, and flew to an attack. What was the Shadow Fleet? Had the spirits of the brave Cupian aviators of the past returned to free their beloved country from Hymernian domination? The two fleets, bees and ghostly planes, had now completely joined battle and were drifting slowly to the southeast. Miles came out of his trance, started his engine, and rose into the air intent on joining the fray. On his way, he circled over the city and gave it a glance, a glance in passing. Then he gave it a second glance, for the Cupians, relieved of the menace of the bees, were forming for a second attack on the palace. Instantly, his plans changed. What business had he running off to watch however interesting a sky battle, when right there before him lay a chance to do what he had braved so many misfortunes to accomplish, namely, free his Leela from the unspeakable Yuri. Veering sharply, he landed on one of the upper terraces of the palace. 
He still wore his bandolier of cartridges and still carried his rifle. Filling the magazine, he boldly descended into the building. No one guarded the approaches from the air, for they depended on their aerial allies to do that for them. The upper rooms were deserted, doubtless because the women folk were cowering in the basements, and because the palace guards and Yuri's other henchmen were resisting the attack of Kabo's cupians at the ground level. Kabo himself explored the place unimpeded and unchallenged. Here he was at last, at his journey's end, but where was Leela? Leela, the blue-eyed princess, Leela of the golden curls, his Leela. The rooms which he and she had, occup had occupied showed every sign of continued and present occupancy, even to the crib of the baby king, emblazoned with the arms of the house of Q. Cabo looked reverently around the living rooms of his wife and child, then swept on into the lower levels of the palace. Occasionally he would come upon groups of defenders, but they, naturally assuming that he was one of them, especially as he still wore the black toga of the arsenal guard, gave him but little heed. Whenever the group was not too numerous, he'd shoot them. He hated to do this, but he knew he had to, in order to save his loved ones. Thus he traversed practically the whole of the upper reaches of the palace, without encountering any en his arch-enemy Yuri, or any of the women folk. Yuri was no coward. However much of scoundrel he might be, no one would ever accuse him of that. And so therefore he must not be in hiding. He was apparently not in command of the defense. Therefore he must be either away from the palace or concocting some devilment. Figuring thus, Cabot continued to descend to levels below the ground floor. While treading these subterranean passages, searching, ever searching for either Lilo or Yuri, he came upon one of the palace guards. The fellow was unarmed, so Cabot did not shoot. Instead, he ordered, Up with your hands, and the guard promptly obeyed. Now, the price of your life is to lead me to your king. Indeed, I will with pleasure, for King Yuri will make short work of one who turns traitor to his black guard. The Earthman smiled at this. I am no traitor, this black toga is mere borrowed for. Do you not know Cabot the Minorian? And the other blanched. If Builder, we didn't believe the story you'd return from the planet Minos. I am at your orders, for I'm one of the old guard who served under King Q the Twelfth, the father of Princess Leela, may he rest beyond the waves. <sighs> Lead on, and no treachery. I trust no one who has ever worn the livery of Prince Yuri. So the guard led the way through many winding passages, down to the very bowels of the subterranean labyrinths of the palace. What could Prince Yuri be doing then? Unless he was hiding, which seemed unlikely. Cabot became very suspicious, and rifle in hand, and finger on trigger, watched his guide with an eagle eye. Finally, they came upon a form in an elaborate yellow toga, huddled in a corner. King Yuri, said the soldier laconically. At the sound of the voice, the usurper looked around, and now it became evident that he was crouching there, not for fear, but rather because he was engaged in repairing something the set of typical Peruvian strange-looking tools. Apparently not at all surprised, he hailed his deadliest enemy as ri and rival, as though, as though the latter were a long-lost friend. Yahoo, Cabo the Minorian. I rather expected you would turn up sooner or later, just a minute until I fix this wire, and then I'll be at your service. You see, one of my minds wouldn't explode. No one else seemed able to get at it, the cause of the trouble, so I had to come down here in person. And so saying, he turned back to his work. Miles stepped forward to see what Prince Yuri was doing, and for a brief, for a brief moment, the Earthman's scientific curiosity got the better of his caution. But that moment, brief as it was, proved long enough for the watchful soldier who had led him hither to snatch Miles' rifle from his hand and cover him with its muzzle. Off with your hands! Cabo obeyed. Not to do so would have been suicide. Yuri, still unperturbed, remarked, Well done, Tobo. You shall be promoted for this. Shall I shoot him, sire? No, the usurper ruminated, waving his antennae thoughtfully. Not just now. Wait until I finish with this wire. In the meantime, you might let the Minorian lean against the wall, so it will be more comfortable. So Miles leaned against the wall and waited his hands still held high, while the prince puttered around in the corner. 
Finally, after a seemingly indeterminable period, Yuri arose, slung his tools together, brushed one hand against the other, and looked at his victim with a cruel smile. Shall I kill him now? No, I am reserving that pleasure for myself, the prince replied, and then spoke to Kabo. At last you are in my power. I intend to shoot you myself. I intend to shoot you down unarmed. Turning to Tobo, the prince asked, How is our battle going? Uh, very well, sire. We are repulsing all assaults, in spite of the departure of the bees to the southward. A momentary cloud of doubt spread over the sinister, handsome vintage, visage of Prince Yuri. Then he smiled. Excuse me. Then he smiled and said, Doubtless the boss knew, the bees knew what they are about. And we'll soon return to the fray. So let us proceed with the execution. Follow me. Miles followed. Almost was he tempted to spring upon his enemy and attempt to throttle him before the inevitable bullet from Tobo could do its work. It would be well worth the sacrifice of his own life to... It would be well worth the sacrifice of his own life to rid Cupia of this incubus. What if Yuri should survive? No, it'd never do to risk it. So he meekly followed. The prince led the way up several levels until they came to a small circular chamber hung with curtains. At one side was a dais, an electric sodium or er, an electric vapor lamp on a ceiling furnished the light. Prince Yuri took the rifle from the guard, stood miles in the center of the room, and sat himself down on the dais. Then he directed Tobo, Go and summon the Princess Leila hither, for I wish her to see me kill this lover of hers, this beast from another world. Miles winced at the mention of his beloved, and thereat his tormentors smiled. The soldier departed on his errand. Yuri, toying, Yuri toyed with the weapon and watched his victim with a sneer on his handsome lips. Miles returned his stare without flinching. You can put down your hands if you wish, you fur-faced math lab, the prince remarked. Kabo did so and instinctively felt of his face. The insult was unwarranted, for he'd only shaved that morning. Don't get too far. Remember Polas' proverb, you cannot kill a Minorian. I've got a mind to kill you just... Or rather, no, that was that was Cabo. Uh, don't go too far. Remember Poblath's proverb: "You cannot kill him in Orion." I've got a mind to kill you just right now, just to prove to you that your friend is wrong. Oh, well, go ahead and try it. Miles challenged, half hoping that Yuri would take him at his word, and thus spare Leela the pain of attending the execution. A grim look settled on the usurper's face as he slowly raised the rifle and pointed it at the Earthman's right side. Left side, remember, my heart's on the other side than it is the case with you Cupians. Aye, but you are a cool one, Yuri admired, shifting his arm as directed. Now are you prepared to die? Yes. It all seemed like a dream. It couldn't be possible that he was really going to die on the faraway planet Venus. Perhaps all his adventures in the skies had been a mere dream. He was about to be awakened. Thus do I bring peace to Poros, the Cupian so Hang on, wait, 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 what was that word? I turned the page too quickly. Thus do I bring peace to Poros, the Cupian sententiously de declaimed. His finger closed upon the trigger. And a rifle spat fire. I am very tempted to just take <laughs> take a breather before the final chapter. Just really ratchet up the tension. But uh no, I'll resist the urge to do that. We will read the final chapter.
27, peace on Poros. Miles felt a sharp, warm pain in his shoulder, but he stood tall. He wasn't dead. Could it be that Yuri had missed? Shaking himself together and blinking his eyes, Miles stared at the prince. And the prince stared back, with an open-mouthed expression of surprise. His eyes were fish-like. His body was no longer erect. The rifle lay in his lap, and he seemed to be feebly trying to raise it and point it at Cabot. Then, with a gurgle, some blood welled from the prince's mouth and trickled down from his chin. With one supreme effort, his antennae radiated the words, Curse you! And the rifle dropped, clattering from his nerveless hands, and his body slouched forward, prone, at the, prone on the floor at the foot of the dais. From the right side of his back there protruded the jeweled hilt of a dagger. Behind the couch, between parted curtains, stood a wild-eyed Cupian woman, her face hideous with pent-up hate and triumph. For a moment, Miles stood rooted to the spot, then, tearing his feet free, he rushed to his fallen enemy and plucked out the dagger. From the wound there gushed bright cerise-colored blood, foamy with white bubbles. Miles turned the body over and listened at the right side of the chest. Not a sound. Then the prince's chest collapsed. With a sigh, a little more blood welled out of the mouth, and all was still once more. Prince Yuri, the most highly developed specimen of Cupian manhood, but a renegade, traitor, rejected wooer of the Princess Leela, pretender to the throne of Cupia, Prince Yuri was dead. And such an ignominious death for his someone of high spirits to die. "'stabbed in the back by a woman. "'Cabot rose and faced her, "'the jeweled dagger still in his hand. "'Who are you? "'Why did you do it?' "'I am Okapa,' she replied in a strained voice. "'Okapa from the mountain village of Bronf. "'Do you remember how in the Second War of Liberation "'you found Luno Castle deserted, "'a slain infant lying on the royal bier?' Uh, can I ever forget it? He answered, his mind going back into the past. Naturally, I thought it was my baby son, whom I'd never seen. Therefore, I fought all the harder against the usurper Yuri until I drove him and his aunt-allies aunt southward, rejoined Leela and Kuwana, and learned that little Q was safe, that the dead child was but an orphan baby, whom Leela had substituted for her own baby for fear of just such an outcome. He was no orphan! It was mine! Mine! The dead child was mine! Yuri stabbed my child, and now I've stabbed him with a self-same dagger! You ki Yuri killed my baby, and now I've slain him! Now I must die myself for killing a king! So saying, her anger spent, she flung herself upon the couch and wept silently, as is the habit of Cupians. Just then, the Princess Leela in a black gown swept into the room. They told me the king wished to see me here. Where is the king? She stopped abruptly as she saw the body on the floor. Then her eyes rose until they rested on Miles Cabot. With a glad cry, she rushed forward into his outstretched arms. But a peremptory shout of, Hands up! from the doorway caused her to halt. She was between Miles and the door. He still held the jeweled dagger in his hand, and stepping quickly to one side, he cast it straight at Tobo, who stood by the entrance, a rifle in his hands, and before the Cupian soldier could raise his weapon to fire, the missile had penetrated his heart. Down he went with a crash. While this had been going on, Okapa, the mad woman, had crept stealthily toward Yuri's body with a view to securing the rifle which he had dropped. Seizing it, she leapt to her feet with a shriek. You too! She cried, pointing at Lila with one skinny finger. For it was you who took my babe from the orphanage and exposed him to danger. Your joint murderer with Yuri, I leave him I've slain. Now it's your turn. But Miles stepped between her and the princess and wrenched the gun from her poor mad hands, where she flung herself upon him, clawing and biting like a demon. It was only a work of a few minutes, however, to get both her wrists behind her back. 
Leela, sensing the need, ripped some strips from the hanging draperies, and together they tied the woman and seated her to one side. Then, once more, the long-separated Earthman and his Cubian beloved started to embrace, while Okapa, gla while Okapa glared at them with baleful eyes. This was too much for Miles. Just one pair apart, he said, and stepping over to Okapa, he spun her around until she faced the wall. Then he clasped his princess to him in a long embrace. But at last a pang intruded in his bliss. Leela, dearest, where is our little son? She shook herself together. I know not. They would not let me know, for fear that the usurper, may he rest beyond the waves, might force the secret from me. But our country is more important than our child. While we tarry here, the battle rages. Quick to the upper level levels, let us take control. We cannot do so without a message from the king, from their king. Let us therefore bring them one. Stooping down, he picked up the dead body of Prince Yuri and flung it across his shoulder. Lead on. As they emerged up a flight of stairs into the main hall of the palace, they saw a frantic throng of palace guards piling tables, chairs, and other furniture into a barricade across one of the doorways. Evidently, the troops of Emsul and Hababa had penetrated the palace and had driven the defenders back to this point. The golden-curled Leela, standing straight and slim in her black gown, stopped all this. Stop all this work with a, a fortification with an imperious gesture. Deceased! I, your princess, commanded. The war is over. Yuri the usurper is dead. Prove it! snarled back the guards like a pack at bay, recoiling from her regal presence. Here's your proof, Miles Cabot shouted, stepping forward and casting Yuri's body down before them. Your king is dead. It's true. The king is dead. Yuri is dead. Long live King Q! Long live King Q! shouted all the palace thugs, just as the besiegers stormed over the barricade with leveled rifles. The shouts within, at the sight of their princess and their intrepid Earthman leader, they grounded their arms and, holding their left hands aloft, gave the Peruvian greetings. Yahoo, Miles Cabot! Our regent has returned from Minos to rule over us. Then one guardsman had an idea. Come, let us mount to the upper terraces, haul down the yellow pennants of King Yuri, and restore the red banner of the Q dynasty. From one of the balconies came a boyish, vo boyish voice. It's already been done, Miles Cabot. Everyone looked up, and there stood Yuri's younger brother, the loyal Prince Toron, wearing the insignia, the insignia of the Admiral of the Cupian Irony. I hope you don't mind, Miles. I made myself Admiral on my own hook. You see, while all the bees were here at Kiwana bombing your men, I captured the airbase at Wartusa with a crowd of ex-aviators who, who had assembled for that purpose. We've been hiding in the woods for several saints, with spies of what you said to inform us when there was an opening. When the time came, we walked right in, killed a few old bees who were on guard, reconditioned the planes which have lain in storage ever since my brother seized the throne, painted them with silver paint, flew up to here to Kuana, and put the bees out of business. The silver paint was my own idea, and I must say it seemed to work. The bees couldn't see us at all against the silver sky. The plaza and the fields beyond are strewn with dead and dying Hemernians, and my men are trekking down the survivors. But he would have chattered on in his boyish excitement, but not one of the soldiers brutally interrupted with, Thy brother lies dead, O Toron. The young prince followed the pointing finger of the guard until his eyes rested on the crumpled body in its blood-stained yellow toga. Then he flung his arm across his face to blot out the sight. For a few moments he stood thus, all while respectfully those nearby kept silent. At last he uncovered his eyes and addressed the Earthman. May he rest beyond the ways. I crave the corpse so I can give my brother a decent funeral. He shall be buried with full royal honors, for he was a brave and regal Cupian who would have served his country well if his inordinate ambition had not blinded his judgment. My cousin shall have royal burial. It would be due you, Toron, for your share in the victory, if for no other reason. 
I, I, I appreciate this courtesy more than words can express. The news of the capitulation had rapidly spread, and the huge hall was filling with Cupians from without. Among them came Emsul, Nanan, Hababa, Oyaba, and even Poblath the Philosopher. Warm were the greetings between the friends. Where is our king? Miles asked as soon as he could free himself from all the congratulation. Now it can be told, Poblath replied. He's safe from the care of my wife, the fur, in our via at Lai. The darling, I'll go to him at once. And I too. But no. But no, Hababa interposed, for the populace are already gathering in the stadium and demanding a speech from the great liberator. Ah, so be it. Affairs of state cannot wait even the presence of the king, it seems. But shall these black to togered guards be permitted to retain their arms? And Sula asked. Uh, why not? Their only crime is they fought loyally for their leader. Besides, this is a free country. One of our grievances against the usurper was that he deprived us, us of our rifles. Then to the palace soldiery. Care tenderly to the body of Prince Yuri, laid out in state, pending our return. Oh, and I almost forgot. There is a crazy woman bound in one of the cellar rooms. Turn her over to the Mongo of Kuwana for her incarceration of the Mongul. And under peril of your lives, do not permit her to escape. All hail our regent, and our most beautiful and beloved princess, shouted the guards as Miles and Leela left the prowess. A curcool waited them at the gate. Getting into this, they proceeded at a slow rate through the city and across the plaza, toward the stadium through lanes of cheering Cupians. Prince Toran, Emsul, Hababa, Oyaba, and others of their retinue followed them. The plaza and the fields beyond were strewn with bodies, mostly in fragments, of the once great race of the Hymernians. One of these bees, as they passed it, gave sign of still possessing some life. A faint whistling noise assailed the antennae of the passing procession. Gabo gave one look in the direction of the sound and signaled the Kurtuls to stop, dismounted, and approached the dying creature. Adjusting his control to the wavelength of the bee speech, he sadly said, Poor Theris, once my friend, whom I made king of the bees, it grieves me to see you lying thus, struck down in a war against my people. Raising himself feebly, the dying Portheris replied, I, he, I bear you no malice, Miles Gabo. I pray that you will bear me none. Although I opposed the war when it came to a fight of my own race against race, I was loyal to my own as any honorable individual would have been under the circumstances. Perhaps it is just as well, for do you not remember that when you were driving the Ant-Men off the face of Cupia, you said, there's no room on any given planet for more than one race of intelligent beings? Now the last Formian is gone, and the last of my own people is gone. May Cupia be at peace. It is my sincere wish of your own friend. The huge bee fell back, quivered for a moment, and lie still. Thus died Portheris, the last of the Hymernians. You rest beyond the waves, dear friend, the Earthman murmured as he returned sadly to his car. They found the stadium packed with cheering throngs and gala attire. Everywhere fluttered flags of the Q dynasty. After Leela had been comfortably seated, and Marshal Ha and the others had arrived, Miles stepped to the transmitter and was about to broadcast some appropriate remarks to the assembled multitude when an airplane arrived overhead and settled softly into the arena. From the plane there stepped Poblath the Philosopher, followed by Betha, his dark and beautiful wife. Both were smiling, and Betha held in her arms a baby Cupid. Then Cabot spoke into the microphone. Behold, your king! It was the shortest speech he'd ever made, and the best. And thus came Q the Thirteenth into his own. There's not much more to tell. Prince Toron retained his self-given title of Admiral of the Air Navy. Hababa was restored to his professorship at the Royal University. Oyaba was pro pro promoted to full professorship. Poblath the Philosopher again became Mangul of Kuwana, 
and his wife was made governess of the infant king. Infant king, rather. And Sewell, the veterinary, was given the title of court physician. Infinite King would make for a very different book. <laughs> Owa, the holy leader, died shortly after this, and Nan Nan was selected by the Great White Lodge as the fit person to reestablish the lost religion throughout the planet of throughout the planet. Miles and Leela, leaving their friends to reconstruct the capital, departed for a vacation at Luno Castle. Thus ends the story of the adventure of the of Miles Cabot, the radio man, on his return to the silver planet Venus, as received by this Harvard scientist and myself over the long distance radio set at my farm on Chappaquiddick Chepo Island, Massachusetts. Thus signed, Ralph Milne Farney. I might be saying the author's name wrong incorrectly. Oh, there's like a, there's a little tiny, uh, there's a little tiny blurb for the next story in this sequence called On the Wrong Side of Venus, maybe? I don't know what those blurbs are, to be honest. Uh, okay. Neat. All right. Uh, this has been the Radio Planet. Uh, that one, I really liked that, to be honest with you. I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, oh, what was I gonna say? Uh, honestly, I think I'm just gonna call it a night here. Uh, I don't have any short stories prepped to fill the rest of the rest of the time. Uh, so we're just gonna call it a short episode this this evening. Um, yeah, I like I said the. Like I said near the beginning, uh, I am I am in talks with a couple of authors to try and get some uh, different genre of story involved. Uh, a couple solar punk uh, solar punk tales actually is what I'm aiming for. We'll see if they happen. I hope they do. But either way, this has been paper cuts. I hope it didn't stink. Thank you.